Thank you everyone for joining from all over the place, all over the globe <laughs> for this uh, wonderful um, experience that we are starting today. As Julie um, mentioned, we, we gave this simple title, Dive in Search of Pearls, an introduction to the writings of St. Maximilian Kolbe. When we began uh, talking about the possibility of having this uh, uh, four sessions or uh, as an introduction, uh, I that image popped uh, in my mind because that has been my experience in, uh, in working uh, with the writings of St. Maximilian Kolbe uh, in coming to, to know them really is like an ocean of uh, where uh, wonderful pearls are, uh, uh, are not hidden, but are uh, uh, everywhere, everywhere. And, uh, uh, and so that image I wish uh, to, to be the one that we keep in mind as we begin our journey. When uh, I started praying uh, for these four sessions, uh, I, I did a little research concerning precisely the search for pearls in the, in the real sense of the word. And I found a lot of stuff, as you can imagine, when you, you begin searching, Google it, as they say, <laughs> so many uh, pages concerning um, <coughs> Pearls came up, but uh, I like to summarize what, um, what I discovered about uh, finding pearls in five points that uh, seem to me very appropriate for what we are about to do. Okay, to find pearls, first of all, we have to find a guided diving tour. Second, very important, to be good swimmers. Third, to wear the proper attire. Fourth, and here we come to the, uh, to the real deal, take a very good dive. And finally, pry open the oyster. Open the oyster and discover the, the purse. So these five steps that are uh, suggested out there for uh, searching for purse, I thought that could be applied to what we are about to do. And today, uh, again, we are just beginning our diving tour. I think uh, you trusted the invitation and you found <laughs> your diving tour. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, uh, I wanted to give you some, uh, some introduction to the tour itself. First of all, for uh, some of you, uh, with some of you, we have shared uh, much uh, of, uh, of our journey in DMI. Some of you I am meeting today uh, for the first time. Some will uh, probably follow us later on uh, um, as they watch this um, uh, program, this uh, presentation. I wish on a personal level to share with you that I've been blessed uh, with uh, the possibility of diving uh, in search of pearls uh, in the writings of St. Maximilian Kolbe many times in my life. Uh, uh, I have been an MI member uh, now for, um, for over 50 years. I'm going to, uh, to share that much. And uh, uh, we were blessed in my home country to have uh, the, the complete collection of the writings of St. Maximilian Kolbe when I was just a teenager uh, or even younger than that in the 70s. And, uh, uh, and so the, uh, the old collection of the writings of St. Maximilian Kolbe was very much part of my formation. In the MI, uh, then in the community of the Father Corby missionaries, I, I joined. Uh, and uh, in the most uh, uh, more recent years, uh, I, I am sharing something personal, but I think this is all for the purpose of uh, bringing to light uh, uh, our goal. I was blessed uh, from 2006 uh, to 2012 to be assigned uh, as a missionary to Poland the very homeland of St. Maximilian Kolbe. 
to walk uh, literally on his, his footsteps uh, in uh, where he, he was born, where he spent much of his life and uh, where he ministered, where, uh, and where he eventually gave his life because our house, our retreat house is just a few miles from uh, the concentration camp of Auschwitz where St. Maximilian gave his life in 1941. Those uh, six years were like a full immersion in uh, in the life and, and mission of St. Maximilian. After that, I felt uh, when my uh, the term of my assignment uh, was uh, concluded, I had been... Um, a very it was an intense, beautiful time. I ask for a special time of prayer. You may call it sabbatical, not so much because I needed a break or to rest, but I wanted to unpack the treasure of what I had experienced in Poland. And I was blessed, I spare you the details, to spend those a few months of sabbatical at the shrine of St. Maximilian Kolbe at Marytown. And during that time, I reread the writings of St. Maximilian from cover to cover, slowly every single day, as I was, that was my special, precious time of prayer uh, with the Lord in the company of St. Maximilian and Our Lady. And uh, it was during that time that I was asked. Uh, sort of unexpectedly, by the MI International to serve as the general editor for the English translation of the writings of St. Maximilian Kolbe. <coughs> and to my amazement, I look back and I thought, wow, St. Maximilian wrote in, um, uh, in Polish, in Italian, in Latin, uh, and uh, and I am Italian. I studied Latin. I lived in Poland and I was blessed with... Uh, uh, and, and there Our Lady was offering me this uh, uh, possibility of serving the cause of making this great treasure available to, um, to the English-speaking countries, an endeavor that had been uh, attempted uh, for many decades and for one reason or another uh, was never possible to bring it to fruition, to completion. And uh, uh, so from 2013 to 2016, almost every day I spent six, seven hours with St. Maximilian Colby <laughs> uh, as uh, I was working with professional, a team of professional translators who were doing the translation and then would send me installments for... Um, for me to revise against the originals in Polish, Italian, Latin, whatever that might have been the case. And, uh, uh, and so I can tell you this much. Uh, I, that's why the image of to dive in search of pearls <laughs> is so meaningful to me, because uh, in those years I discovered pearls upon pearls as I was... Uh, uh, um, spending time to, to revise the translation in the finest detail, even better than previously when I was reading, reading it for my personal uh, formation, inspiration, prayer, having to check the translation. I was really looking at every single word as I was working with a, a most dedicated, my member, Mary, um, whom some of you know, uh, she and I so many times found ourselves uh, to be arrested by something that we were reading and that was jumping at us as uh, a revelation. And uh, um, so, uh, you know, for uh, up to 2016, when the, uh, the two volume set of the writings of St. Maximilian was uh, finally published and released uh, and, and made available both uh, as a hardcover uh, version, but also the following year as a, a digital uh, ebook. Uh, he, in the English speaking countries, and my members have nourished their uh, spirituality, drawing from tiny little collections of. Uh, 
thought of the Maximilian like this one. Some of you are, have been my members for a long time and might be very familiar with this <laughs> little book, A Meyer, which uh, was the English translation of this Polish book, uh, whose title was about the ideals of the MI that had been compiled by uh, some holy good friars in Poland uh, during the Second World War. Immediately, they felt the need of treasuring, collecting something uh, of their uh, of the words of St. Maximilian Kolbe. Then there were a couple of other publications. Uh, Mary was his middle name. The Kolbe readers were uh, some special pages of the, uh, of the writings uh, of St. Maximilian Kolbe had been collected, but it was not even a 10%, not even a 5% of all that uh, he, we are blessed to have now. So I, I think it's so, I, it's so important for us to, to be aware that we now do have a treasure, a magnificent treasure in this collection of the writings of St. Maximilian. And I wanted as a, 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 for the purpose of introducing ourselves in this tour to give you a little bit of background of how the collection itself for the writings of St. Maximilian Kolbe came about. First, uh, we must uh, um, say simply that St. Maximilian really didn't leave behind a, a literary theological work uh, per se. He was not, uh, we don't have uh, the equal of uh, the Summa uh, of St. Thomas Aquinas or uh, the, the Confessions of uh, St. Augustine or other great saints. St. Maximilian, except for some preliminary outlines for uh, a, a book that he intended or he was asked to write about Our Lady and the MI, he didn't leave behind uh, any again, as I said, literary or theological work. Uh, obvious literary production, uh, we have uh, very many, uh, very many, I would ask, uh, uh, someone has the microphone on, if you could please silence, uh, that would be great. Um, he left uh, behind many articles uh, uh, that have been preserved in magazines that he founded uh, in Poland, uh, but also in other, um, other magazines in, in Italy, for example, and even American magazines where some of his articles uh, were uh, published. Um, we don't have the original manuscripts of these articles, but uh, those that were uh, uh, very carefully recognized as his very articles had been uh, uh, collected and preserved. What he uh, left uh, uh, for us uh, to, to really dive in is a, a very uh, large collection of, um, of his letters. Um, we have about over a thousand of his letters in the, um, collected in the first volumes of um, the writings. And keep it, this in mind that uh, many of these letters were written to his superiors, uh, uh, to his relatives, his mom, his brothers, uh, even to the Pope. We have a, a letter of two that he wrote. Um, but uh, uh, nearly all the letters that he wrote to the readers of the magazines and to my members, uh, which must have been quite many, have been lost. So just uh, think that we do have this ocean, <laughs> uh, 25,000 pages uh, of uh, writings, but uh, uh, we can be grateful that all this was preserved. We also have uh, some notebooks. When he was very young in his uh, religious life, he began keeping a little diary where he would... Uh, uh, jot down the reflection and resolutions uh, of his retreats, 
Also, he began uh, to take even shorter notes of his meditations. Uh, and then he would have a journal when he was traveling where he would uh, write uh, people he met, uh, uh, things he saw. And sometimes in, while he was traveling on a boat or, an, or a train, he was hit by a special inspiration and, and is, again, a pearl uh, that he's like hidden in the midst of perhaps pages where he's simply describing what he's seen from the wind of the train. <laughs> and then a revelation comes uh, through. And uh, uh, so this uh, uh, material has been collected. And when uh, all this was collected, first, uh, it might be amazing for us to, to be grateful for, actually, more than amazed, that already during the Second World War, some of the Franciscans at Nepokalanov uh, began collecting what they could find of the writings of their beloved founder, uh, Father Maximilian Kolbe. They wanted to, to place into safety the originals because, well, we were during the Second World War and, uh, uh, and they were uh, able to do so. Eventually, uh, they um, did like a, a little uh, for private use publication of, uh, of those uh, writings that they had collected precisely for the purpose of nourishing the MI ideals in their own lives. And that's uh, uh, what I showed to you. This is a more recent uh, uh, Polish edition, but uh, uh, this is what became for us a Meyer. This was the work of those uh, holy friars in, uh, in 1940, 46, 47. Can you believe that? They just uh, understood uh, that uh, so much uh, um, that this man was a holy man <laughs> and that uh, what he had spoken to them was a life-giving was uh, were life giving words and they wanted to treasure them. But uh, as uh, you might know, um, the process of beatification of Saint Maximilian began very early. He died as a martyr. And then uh, uh, the Franciscans, uh, between 1966 and 1970, appointed a, a commission of 10 friars to work. Uh, uh, entire, <laughs> tirelessly to collect uh, uh, the, um, um, the writings of St. Maximilian Kolbe, everything that uh, they could possibly find everywhere. And uh, um, they work uh, with the cooperation of some 150 other people. And uh, the, this uh, very patient uh, uh, work uh, was eventually published in the first uh, critical collection in Polish, where nine typewritten uh, manuscript uh, volumes that uh, uh, collected all that they had been able to find, uh, whether articles, letters, no notes, uh, reflections. And uh, um, this is... Uh, extremely important because to this day, this is considered the original body of the, um, of the writings because they really did uh, a very careful work of uh, making sure that uh, something was authentic, whether it was because his signature was there, his handwriting, or because it could be traced back. And keep in mind that in the 60s and 70s, they were blessed to have still Franciscans, friars, who had lived with Saint Maximilian Kolbe. So the timing was just uh, providential. Where are now the originals? Uh, they are in many different places. Uh, the originals, the main collection of the originals that are uh, uh, can be um, letters and written by St. Maximilian, a little postcard and written by St. Maximilian, or uh, something that he typed himself, uh, or uh, again, articles that uh, uh, he wrote but were uh, 
uh, typed and, and published by uh, in, in the magazines. The main collection of the originals is in Poland, at Niepokalanov, at the city of the Immaculata there. And uh, uh, when uh, um, we go on pilgrimage to Niepokalanov, many times we with the MI, with the my members especially, we have asked for permission to visit the archives and and be able to see and touch some of these precious originals. Some originals are, of course, in Tokyo in the archive of the Franciscans uh, uh, in Japan. Some are in Rome uh, um, in the archives of the General Curia of the Franciscans, especially the the documents, the letters that he wrote to major superiors or other friars uh, who were. Uh, in Italy, and also the notebooks. And that's interesting that the, the diary, the notebooks uh, are preserved at the General Curia in Rome. Some other uh, um, originals are in Padua, uh, because for a time the national center of the MI was, uh, for Italy, was in Padua. And there, there are quite a few letters, uh, quite a few documents. And uh, uh, as I said before, all the manuscripts of the articles have been lost, uh, perhaps when he was just jotting down an article, because then he would have it typed. But again, they were carefully, they've been carefully um, um, recognized as authentic. Those that we have, we know for sure. When in doubt, they left them out. Um, so now the, the, our ocean here, our, uh, the ocean that we'll be diving in, uh, what do we have here? We have um, all the, the letters that uh, have survived. As I said, a great number have written to my members, to readers were lost. But we have more than a thousand. If you um, if you open the volume, if you are already blessed to have a copy, then we have the personal notebooks. Um, we have the published articles, uh, those that were eventually published in the different magazines, in the newspaper, in the Night of the Immaculata, in other MI publications, even in other countries. But we also have unpublished articles, which means uh, articles that he began drafting, uh, but that didn't make it to the publication, but they were still recognized as his own and therefore have been collected. We have uh, the material for a book. I was telling you initially that uh, he did work on a uh, outline for writing a book about Our Lady. He also had the, the outline for a, a, a little pamphlet when he was in Japan to, to introduce people to Our Lady. Then we have what have been called the personal writings, which means he would, for example, for a birthday or a, a name day, he would write a little or a, or a uh, on a book, he would write a little dedication to one of the Franciscans or to an MI member. Or, uh, and those, uh, you know, eventually were uh, turned in as precious. And they, uh, they were not necessarily a letter, but they were uh, personal notes from him. And some are just most beautiful. We have some legal writings. Most importantly, we have the original charter of the MI, but some other documents that he wrote for uh, the organization of Nipokalanov. Uh, he had uh, this you, brilliant mind. Uh, he was managing 700 and plus friars. <laughs> and so that little city uh, or big city uh, was very well organized. But also, and finally, we do have uh, three manuscripts of his uh, teenage years, uh, uh, scientific writings. When, uh, and that is another side of this uh, brilliant man. So now, as we come uh, to a close, um, of course, uh, this, the, the articles were meant for publication, so they were drafted more accurately. Perhaps they are uh, uh, because his mind was more uh, of a catechetical approach to different topics. 
Uh, perhaps they, uh, by scholars, have been considered less interesting and less original than other writings uh, um, for understanding, for the purpose of understanding the man and the saint. Instead, the letters, uh, precisely because they sprang from the fullness of the heart uh, and not uh, necessarily from thoughtful, prolonged reflection, they were not written for publication. They enable us to know the mind and the heart in an incredibly beautiful way, enable us to, to really see what was uh, seizing <laughs> all the time in the soul and the mind of this man. I confess that the letters are my favorite part of the whole collection, along with the, the note. Um, and this is, again, going back to what we, I said at the beginning, uh, St. Maximilian was not a theologian by profession, a thinker. He was, uh, by all, uh, um, uh, with the common agreement, uh, definitely, a, a mystic and a missionary. And uh, we may say that he, he did engage in some theological reflection, of course, for the purpose of uh, not so much uh, uh, striving after objective clarity around uh, some particular truth necessarily. His main goal was that of uh, infecting or uh, communicating or passing on the the love for God and for Our Lady that was brimming him, that was filling his heart. So uh, from uh, his writings, uh, we, um, we can really say that we come in touch with his very heart and soul. And I know that my time is running out. And uh, uh, to close, if I may, um, have a couple of uh, minutes I would like to, to close our first session inviting uh, you to, to pray with me or to read with me um, the writing number 1306 in the second volume. The title is How to Read. And this is what uh, he himself had written. I will tell you why I am... Uh, suggesting to close our first session with this. When you start to read something on the Immaculata, do not forget that at that moment you come into contact with a living being who loves you, who is pure, without any stain. Also remember that the words you see are unable to express who she is because they are human words drawn from earthly concepts, words that present all things in a human manner, while the Immaculata is a being totally of God. Thus, she is in some way infinitely more sublime than, than all that surrounds you. She will reveal herself to you through the phrases that you read and will convey to you thoughts, convictions, feelings that the author himself could not possibly even imagine. Consider carefully also that the purer your conscience is, and the more you wash it with penance, the closer to the truth your knowledge about her will be. Recognize also with sincerity that without her help, you are utterly unable to do anything in the work of knowledge and consequently of love of her. Acknowledge that she alone must enlighten you more and more. She alone must draw your heart toward herself with love. Remember, therefore, that all the fruit of your reading depends on prayer to her. Do not start reading then before appealing with some prayer for her help. Do not worry about reading much, but rather intertwine your reading with elevation of your heart to her, especially when feeling of another nature awaken in your heart. Then, when you finish your reading, entrust to her the yield of an ever more beautiful fruit. 
as you might uh, uh, imagine, I suggested to, to close with this, and I would encourage you to read it again on your own, as uh, the way we want to approach uh, our diving in the writings of St. Maximilian. Uh, you will see that uh, uh, as we go on, uh, that really we'll discover the Immaculata as the hidden treasure in the writings of St. Maximilian, even in pages where he talks about the rising cost of paper, where mm -hmm. he talks about uh, a, a printing machine that breaks down. You will, uh, I, uh, I wanted to give you an hint uh, that uh, I think we have to put ourselves uh, as we in, uh, embark on this uh, tour in this attitude of we are going to encounter the living presence of Our Lady through uh, and in the words uh, of her great uh, apostle and saint, our founders and Maximilian Kolbe. So I wish you uh, to, to try to begin to do so uh, as you, uh, as we wait to meet again next month. And uh, my last pitch is uh, we are, uh, if you haven't, uh, uh, purchase the writings yet, I would highly, highly suggest to consider investing because it's like a treasure that the cost for uh, is doesn't equal. <laughs> so thank you for your patience for my with my going over time a little bit. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Antonella. I, I did have one quick question. I don't know if anyone else maybe had a question for Antonella. Is, is there a, maybe anything you would like us to take a look at if we do have the writings in preparation for next time? Well, I, I think... Uh, I would like you to, to read again on your own that uh, 1306 I just read. And uh, um, in my, my first suggestion is uh, perhaps uh, uh, read the introduction to the first volume where uh, it says the introduction to, I'm giving you the actual title. I summarized for you uh, how the, the writings came about, but I think it might be uh, is the foreword to the English edition, the air, uh, excerpts from the introduction to the Italian edition. Um, if you um, could read those pages, uh, mm -hmm. it will give you more details of what I, I summarized for time purposes uh, this morning. But I think it's important for us to value the work of those who came before us uh, that in order to realize how precious this is and how authentic this is. We have, uh, uh, you know, considering the time frame, considering that he died in 1941 during Second World War, <laughs> we could have lost everything if we're not for those holy people who began collecting and who preserved and divine providence allowed this to happen. So there is a responsibility that we have, even in, uh, that's why I, I, I think it would be appropriate for you to spend some time reading those pages and then try in, in light of uh, that uh, 1306 reading I just uh, gave you to uh, to dive in, to open uh, a, 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 the writings, perhaps even randomly, and try to uh, to see the Immaculata, try to to approach it with those sentiments that he suggests there. Uh, we are not just reading his uh, human words. We want to detect the work of the Holy Spirit and the presence of Our Lady, and you will see that those words come to life for you if you approach them in this way. Okay. Thank you, Antonella. Anyone maybe just field a couple questions or comments? May I ask a question, Juliet? Yes, Juliet. Yeah. Okay. Antonella, I just want to check, would you have any idea how many rosaries uh, St. Maximum Colby used to pray on a day? Well, uh, so we come across that. Um, we know we know that because of his health, uh, he had been given a dispensation uh, 
uh, from uh, uh, the recitation of the Liturgy of the Hours. You know that priests uh, are uh, is mandatory for priests to celebrate all the hours of, but because of his uh, um, health, uh, you know, he had tuberculosis and stuff. And, uh, uh, and so he had been given a dispensation. We don't know exactly how much he took advantage of that dispensation <laughs> or if, uh, but uh, in uh, the, the rosary would be uh, taking the place. Uh, you know, I, he, uh, he was very uh, sparingly in sharing uh, his penitential or, uh, or prayer practices. Uh, so we can be sure that he probably prayed many a rosary, <laughs> but uh, he didn't give us uh, a, an account of how many rosary a day he did pray. At least uh, in my recollection of uh, what we have here, he didn't. Good question. Anyone else? We, what we know, for example, is not the rosary, but we know from witnesses that uh, he even in the high of his apostolic work, he would always find, or even in the, uh, when he was in Rome studying, his fellow Franciscans were uh, um, impressed by how he was, for example, every little break, he would step into the chapel to pay a little visit to the Blessed mm -hmm. Sacrament. Yeah. So he found the ways of uh, oh, really disseminating disseminating prayer throughout his day. So we can be sure that he probably prayed many rosary. <laughs> Thank you very much, Antonella. Thank you, mm -hmm. Gerard. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Antonella, thank you so much. That's just been a wealth of um, information. Yes, Scott's clapping. Wealth of information for us. Um, and, and, and quite an invitation, as you said, to dive in and sort of a beginning place to kind of go into those to those writings. So that's that's wonderful. Thank well, you. Then, yes. And so this month, uh, let's practice to be good swimmers and divers. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll dive okay. in, even if uh, at least on this part of the world is cold, uh, we'll be diving in. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. God bless you oh. all. <laughs> oh, thank you, Antonella. Thank you.